keynote talks. Uh, one by Elaine Martis, who, as many of you know, is a pioneer in the use of omics information to study cancer, to classify patients, and to ultimately put patients on clinical trials that's to their benefit. And so she uh, started out by being, I think, one of the pioneers in this space at uh, Wash U St. Louis. Um, since then, she's moved on to a, a new post at Children's Hospital uh, affiliated with um, uh, Ohio State, I believe, at Nationwide. And Elaine is a, a frequent uh, guest at, at Cold Spring Harbor, and I think a, a, a totally uh, terrific uh, keynote speaker for us. So unlike uh, Joanne being an endnote, we have two real keynotes. And so our, our first one is Elaine Martis, who will tell us about personalized cancer genomics impact and implications. Thank you. I'll just put it down here, yeah. I have neither a shirt nor a tie to offer you, so um, I'll just try and stand still as best possible. Can everybody hear me? Um, thanks so much for the nice introduction, Dave, and for the opportunity to speak here on something, um, as I'm sure most of you know, pretty near and dear to my heart. And so I um, wasn't really sure what, uh, what to put together tonight, so I hope you'll enjoy what I've done because it's a little bit um, in some ways new and, and far afield from where I'm uh, normally speaking. But um, really meant to sort of um, take an introspective look at what we're doing currently for targeted therapies and immunotherapies in terms of the interplay of genomics uh, with those two areas and then um, try and be a little bit provocative about where we might need to go. So we'll see how this goes. Um, so um, first of all, uh, you know, I think it would be silly to stand up here and talk about what I'm going to talk about without acknowledging sort of the a huge amount of discovery that has gone on over the past oh, I don't know, uh, nearly 10 years now in terms of really teasing apart the different omics aspects of um, cancer. Um, and this representative just paper here from the um, initial integration of data across 12 different tumor sites from TCGA, um, ongoing work that hopefully we'll be seeing the light of day soon from much larger integration of data sets between TCGA and ICGC. Um, are, are pending, and I've seen some results from those, but just to focus in a little bit on just um, what we've learned from large-scale cancer genomics, um, one clear truth that I think was hinted at by earlier studies but now solidified from this work is that cancer genes are shared across different tissue sites. So I would venture a guess to say there's no such thing as a truly tissue site unique uh, gene driver or um, uh, suppressor at this point in time. Um, cancer genes are altered in many ways. So again, the use of next generation sequencing shows us that mutation, amplification, deletion, structural variation, et cetera, all can be important. And really, in, rather than sort of thinking about mutations in isolation, we have to sort of amalgamate everything together at the genomic level to really get a clear picture of um, frequently altered genes in cancer. And then um, at the end of the day, we know that cancer is not a disease of genes, but rather of altered pathways. And so how do we take everything that we know about a given person's tumor and sort of abstract that up to the pathway level to really better understand what's going on, uh, for lack of a better and more erudite way to describe it. And so, and so I think based on these sort of simple truths um, coming out of uh, large-scale cancer genomics, you know, we've sort of embarked on a new era, if you will, um, of, of, you know, sort of applying this as best possible in the clinical trial setting, um, as I'll talk about, to really try and ideally place patients in the clinical trial from which they're most likely to benefit. Um, and the result of a lot of these ongoing uh, works that I am going to sort of show you and then argue needs to be even better applied to this clinical trial paradigm is the result of um, big data resources that are, you know, sort of there and ever growing. So big science equals big data resources. I know some people so, sort of have a visceral reaction to big science, but um, I will try to argue throughout the talk today that um, we're not going to get anywhere without it, um, and so uh, here we are. So big data resources are emerging, as I've already said, from worldwide efforts to characterize cancer across multiple omic platforms. 
Um, in addition, big data resources are being put together to try and best possible catalog everything that we know in sort of central locations, um, uh, such as the um, uh, genomic data commons uh, data portal that's shown here. Um, and then on top of that, interesting other big data resources are being um, added in, and that includes, and again, just representative data sets here, um, including the CBIO portal, um, where we sort of are amalgamating data not just about the genomics alterations, transcriptomics, et cetera, but also then adding in information about the clinical trials or the drugs that those patients see as a result of their um, genomic analysis and being able to better um, um, sort of uh, put together uh, clinical data along with genomic data um, for the betterment of our understanding of what's going on. And another project of this ilk that I've been involved with as an advisor um, is Project Genie that's being funded by the AACR. And so we have these big data resources and we have a lot of know-how and sort of now how do we start to put this all together um, in the clinical trials paradigm. And what I'll talk about today is basically that with a few fairly simple data sets to generate, um, I think we can do a lot. And so this is the paradigm that I'll sort of focus on um, in terms of the clinical applications of cancer genomics, um, where one simple data set that is fairly straightforward to come up with is just the comparison using next generation sequencing of tumor to normal. Um, and this can be as complex or as easy as you want it to be. It could be a simple, straightforward panel of genes. Um, perhaps better, I would argue, especially in the immunological setting, which we'll get to at the end, a uh, larger data set, such as a large gene panel or exome panel, will give more information. And once we essentially align uh, these data from any given tumor normal to the human genome and uh, identify variants, um, we can then uh, sort of call out separately somatic alterations from germline variants. And one of the impacts of large-scale cancer discovery is that we now know that both are incredibly important, perhaps more so in the context of germline alterations, um, because we now know that that original 2 to 5 percent we thought of heritability for cancer susceptibility um, has now more than doubled um, across tens of thousands of cancers now studied at the germline level. So both are important data sets to accumulate. Uh, why is that? Well, for somatic variants, for, for some time now, we've been just focused on what's the right targeted therapy. And with the ever-expanding compendia of targeted therapies out there, um, we can better identify um, drug-gene interactions that may um, uh, quel squelch pathogenic driver mutations, gene fusion drivers, as well as amplified cancer driver genes. And again, reflecting the multitude of different ways that cancer drivers are implemented by the tumor genome. In addition, and we'll uh, focus on this towards the end of the talk, but calculating the mutational load, if you will, or even the neoantigen load, which I'll talk about, also in some ways, not completely, but in some ways, can be a harbinger of likelihood of response. Um, and in the extreme, neoantigen prediction can actually uh, be taken one step further to create a personalized vaccine. In the context of the germline variants, um, we know that um, there are pathogenic cancer susceptibility mutations. This invokes genetic counseling and additional carrier testing. But more recently, microsatellite instability is uh, now a harbinger of likelihood to respond to um, certain immunotherapies, checkpoint blockade in particular. Um, uh, BRCA1, 2, and other um, homologous repair dis uh, uh, dysfunction genes um, imply PARP inhibitors, often in combination with chemotherapy or other therapies. Um, and these extreme uh, uh, mutations, such as polymerase epsilon, also invoke um, different types of treatment uh, considerations in the immunotherapy space. So there's an ever expanding capability, again, to just take these fairly simple data sets and slice and dice them in multiple ways, depending upon um, the different uh, focus that you are choosing for an individual patient. So as rosy as this all sounds, there's also a lot of skepticism about whether this is really worth doing, um, how important it is, how many patients actually get on to clinical trials or an FDA-approved drug, et cetera. And there are multiple groups that have sort of taken a swing at this with ever-increasing numbers. Uh, perhaps none so large as the group from Memorial Sloan Kettering who reported recently on over 10,000 patients um, taken through their impact panel 
um, and uh, again, sort of directed towards a variety of phase one clinical trials, FDA approved uh, therapies and others. Um, and I won't go into the details of this paper because there are many, um, but I think this is an important benchmark in approaching what we um, commonly refer to in the clinic as clinical utility uh, uh, using next generation sequencing cancer diagno diagnostics. Um, needless to say, an important step forward towards insurance reimbursement, which I won't talk about today um, and don't really want to think about on a regular basis, but um, uh, it has to be part of the equation if we're going to offer this to increasing numbers of patients. So in this vein, you know, we've sort of now moved forward to some evolution, if you will, in the targeted therapy clinical trial design. Um, pictorially represented here, um, uh, one possibility is the so-called basket trial design where you take multiple tissue sites that you think might harbor these uh, mutations that your drug is going after and you test patients just for sort of that one gene and you pile them all together into the basket of your clinical trial and treat them with your drug and sort of see how they do. And often this is done in sort of phase 2A type studies and then you take the sort of best groups of responders and move them forward into phase 2B and beyond towards your registration data, hopefully for your next um, great drug. And that's an okay way to go, and it's been reasonably effective. Um, there's another sort of approach, which is called the umbrella trial, um, just a slightly different version of this, where you have a number of different drugs that um, appeal to different um, alterations in, sp in specific genes. Again, you've sort of got a collection of patients who are presenting in your clinic with different tissue sites, and you essentially divide them up according to which drug gene interaction they're most likely to benefit from. And these are okay. Um, they're, they're sort of an evolution. I think we are all a bit waiting to see um, how registration data does at the FDA for these types of trials, um, because it, to the best of my knowledge, that hasn't sort of happened yet. But what I'd like to argue is that now if we combine sort of this evolved clinical trial model with the big data resources that we actually have to apply to it, we may actually be able to start thinking about a more emergent paradigm in terms of what I would call informed clinical trials. And that's not to say that what I just talked about didn't have information in it, um, but there may be actually more information that we can add into the design of these clinical trials, especially in terms of identifying the right patients. So what might that come down to? Well, one possibility is using these big, da big data resources that I just talked about to sort of hypothetically design your trial using the information and the data that's out there in the context of the drug that you want to put onto trial. Um, not just so much focusing in on a specific gene drug interaction, but also on the panoply of other data types that um, allow you to think more about not just the gene in isolation, but the genes that it's also commonly co-mutated with or mutually exclusively uh, mutated against, et cetera. So one occurs and never the other, et cetera. So this co-occurrence and mutual exclusivity can really only be obtained by examining very, very large data sets because you have to get the numbers together to really understand that. And they can't just be data sets that are focused on point mutation detection. They also have to include information from structural alteration, copy number, et cetera, especially at the DNA level alone. We'll talk in more detail about more complicated scenarios in a moment. Um, and then lastly, this pathway level evaluation, I would argue, is actually maybe a better way to look at this because at the end of the day, our focused drugs are really not just focused on a specific altered protein, but they're really focused on what's the pathway that you want to shut down that's driving the cancer um, that, you're, that you're studying in particular. And um, ultimately, uh, one prediction, bold, perhaps stupid, I don't know, um, is that the resulting trials by sort of applying this big data to design the trial paradigm would be that we might actually have some enhanced accrual as well as efficacy in the setting of the drug um, because by modeling what your accrual could be in different tissue sites with big data, you now can actually better design your uh, trial and the tissue sites that you're choosing, whether basket or umbrella, um, to evaluate in the context of that uh, phase 2A type scenario that we talked about a few moments ago. So this is kind of uh, the paradigm that I want to set forward for you. And now I want to sort of take a step off the cliff here and not just focus on DNA, 
alterations in isolation, but what more can we kind of add to the party, um, not to make this too complicated, hopefully, but actually even more fruitful in terms of um, predicting dr drug efficacy um, in terms of the patients who should be getting accrued onto trials. So I want to talk a little bit about the combinatorial power of DNA and RNA data. Um, and people who hear me speak from time to time know how enamored of RNA I am, and so I apologize in advance uh, for the love affair that I'm having with RNA, but I really think that it's um, adding a lot of information into um, what we're um, thinking about nowadays in terms of uh, this paradigm. So what can we do with RNA? Well, the answer is a lot. I'll just show a few examples here um, so that you don't get bored with it, hopefully, but um, I think it's a really important molecule in this paradigm mainly because by simply looking at DNA in isolation, mutations, et cetera, alterations, we can't really anticipate other types of alterations to DNA, chromatin packaging impacts, methylation impact, et cetera, unless we go and do all of those other types of analyses. And at the end of the day, clinically, we would run out of sample, quite frankly, before we had a chance to evaluate all of these things. I would actually argue that by looking at DNA and RNA together, um, you can maybe interpret or see how the cell is interpreting changes in chromatin packaging and methylation by looking at the RNA expression data itself. And so um, how does this pan out in terms of different things that you can look at in RNA? Well, one thing we worry about a lot in terms of clinical samples is degradation from FFPE. So some years ago, um, we showed that just inserting an exome capture um, in the mix can uh, sa uh, s sort of um, resurrect if you will, RNA samples. So that's just something that we commonly do. Um, another aspect of RNA, of course, is the plethora and ever-increasing understanding of non-coding RNAs across a multitude of sizes. I won't talk about this tonight, but I think there's a lot going on in terms of the uh, regulatory aspects of uh, microRNAs, non-coding RNAs, long non-coding RNAs, et cetera, and, and how those work um, in the cancer paradigm. What I do want to focus on, at least initially, is sort of two things. So one is th this uh, discovery of fusion drivers um, as a surrogate for which um, uh, dependencies you might want to attack in a given patient. Um, and we've been doing a lot of work um, in the pediatric setting, especially where fusion drivers are quite prevalent across both um, heme and solid tissue malignancies to use just directed PCR type assays with known fusion primers to pull these out of RNA as a starting analyte. Um, and so we can use this information then directly for clinical treatment decisions um, as well as clinical trials assignments. Going to a more full-fledged uh, aspect though, if we just take full-length RNA-seq data, um, you know, in the past we largely kind of focused um, more here on just gene expression analysis, but there are lots, w you know, with sort of increasing computational approaches to these data, lots of different ways to evaluate this. So one simple way is just correlative. So if I have an amplified gene, do I also have an amplified amount of RNA? That's simple. Um, same with deletions and looking at the um, DNA-RNA interplay there. Um, there's certainly um, a lot that we can look at in terms of alternative splicing uh, paradigms that are unique to the tumor, um, focusing in, again, on mutations, and as I mentioned, the expression of neoantigens. Um, the RNA here often becomes very important in terms of tumor types with very, very high mutational load because of a carcinogen um, impact, for example. This gets you really to the truth set, I would argue, of uh, what's going on in terms of mutations that you identify and whether they're, in fact, um, being expressed. And then um, a sort of newer area that's, I think, really emerging, again, with the advent of very large data sets, um, especially coming from unbridled RNA sequencing data, is sort of a computational extraction, if you will, um, where we have the ability now with these very large uh, data sets of RNA, and I'll illustrate this in a moment, to get to the level of sort of pathway level biology for any individual tumor by sequencing the RNA and then comparing it to a large data set of compiled RNA signatures, if you will, a meta-analysis or a metadata set that can tell us for an individual patient sort of what the pathway level activity is that's going on in their tumor um, based on the RNA signature and try to correlate that with the DNA and then ultimately identify the best place to drug that patient's tumor um, based on this uh, higher level comparison. And this isn't 
hard, I would argue, because really we're just generating this basic data set that I already talked about, and then we're doing a fundamental comparison to the signatures that are out there, which I'll describe in a moment, and sort of trying to see what we can find um, for that patient. So here's just an example from some work that we've been doing um, in uh, breast cancer, especially looking at the comparison between um, uh, primary tumors and um, metastases, um, evaluating using this um, combinatorial approach with this uh, um, a program called DonRank. And so this is really to identify drivers um, that are active either in the primary tumor or the metastasis or both. And the combination that we use here is um, uh, knowledge of protein interaction networks, of course, that's the pathway level abstraction, mutations, copy number alterations, and then RNA expression data. So Don Rank essentially amalgamates everything together. And in this particular example, where we're comparing sort of founder clone mutations or s uh, copy number drivers to things that are shared between the primary and met, shared between different metastases in patients that have gone through rapid autopsy and we have multiple metastatic sites, or just private to the metastases, or one or more of the metastases themselves, we can see that both at the level of mutations and a little bit less so at the level of copy number, um, we actually have a predominant majority of the genetic drivers that are established in the primary breast cancer and we can name them and we can then look and evaluate what they might correspond to. This is of course good news if it turns out to be true because it means that if we can really identify these drivers in the primary disease, we may actually have an opportunity to not allow that patient to progress uh, to metastatic disease. Hopeful uh, to be sure, but uh, definitely worth uh, testing. There are also um, other examples, not from our work, of multi-omic data integration that I just want to spend a, a last few minutes on before I shift to immunotherapy um, discussion. And that includes, um, for example, a large study, again, from TCGA, um, taking the multiple platforms that were in play in TCGA, again, across the original 12 cancer types, um, to look at molecular classification within and across tissues of origin. So I'll talk about those results in just a moment. There's also a recent sort of taking it down now to just a, s a specific um, tissue site, a recent integrative data analysis um, from a very large group of investigators across the planet um, looking at um, one of the areas where I've been focusing my attention at Nationwide Children's on high-grade and diffuse intrinsic uh, pontine glioma, so um, highly lethal brain cancers um, in our pediatric patient population. And then a, a more recent article that I've just been um, digging into, um, which is a fascinating look um, done by, again, a large group of investigators um, led by Arul Chennai at Michigan, um, looking at what they call the MET 500, so a, a, a collection of 500 metastatic um, tumors, again, from different tissue sites that have been studied using these integrative um, genomic methods that I've uh, been talking about already. So I want to just spend a couple of minutes just focusing in on a couple of results from other people's work um, who I think are, are doing some very innovative and interesting things. So this is from this uh, Nature paper that I just mentioned from the MET 500. Um, you can see sort of from this figure in the paper um, the uh, multitude of different tissue sites um, that were evaluated um, from, these, um, from these patients. And one of the things that um, came out of this um, is, again, an analysis of fusion drivers. Uh, so um, you can just see these um, sort of um, different types of events that result in fusions in the genome, um, and then the different um, impacts, if you will, on the, um, uh, from the fusion that's, that's created. And in addition, um, this group of investigators identified some novel fusions that had never been seen before. Um, all of this coming uh, largely from RNA-seq uh, data evaluation, and, and these were um, verified as well. So that's interesting, but then the, the really interesting thing uh, that, that captivated me here is at a higher level, transcriptome analysis, um, which I won't bore you with the details because it's quite complicated, they were actually able to take this multitude of very, uh, you know, very large number of tumors from multiple tissue sites and in this higher level sort of meta-analysis of signatures of, of the transcriptome, reduce these um, down to literally two different groups. Uh, one with an EMT signature, 
um, from different uh, genes here, including uh, immune genes and uh, obviously inflammation. And then a second sort of more prolifer proliferative signature uh, group uh, that you see sort of clustering here. And they're very uh, mutually exclusive from one another in the context of these different um, gene sort of um, profiles that uh, they, they got out of their meta-analysis. Um, so again, uh, you know, I mean, uh, from the standpoint of trying to um, drug metastatic disease, uh, this may actually indicate that um, metastatic disease, unlike primary, which was also considered through this paradigm and came out not looking uh, nearly this uh, uh, homogeneous, um, might be the way to go and might be an interesting approach um, since most of the patients that we're seeing currently on clinical trials um, are metastatic patients. So um, then from Katie Hoadley's work, uh, uh, you know, sort of commandeering a very, very large number of analysts through the 12 um, pan-cancer uh, data analysis that I uh, showed you just a few minutes ago from Cell um, a couple of years ago, um, I just wanted to spend a few minutes um, because a huge number of results, but th this gets to um, a study that I'll mention just at the end of my talk, focused on bladder cancer. Um, and so I wanted to point out what they found here. So first of all, they had come up with these different clusters using a cluster of cluster-based analysis. Um, and they showed here for bladder cancer sort of a beautiful distribution um, into three different subtypes that then when you impose upon a survival analysis from Kaplan-Meier, um, clearly distinguishes the subtypes according uh, to their outcome in the disease. Indeed, if you then go to the level of uh, DNA and look at the alterations, you can see that for the three different subtypes that they identified, um, very strong separation in terms of uh, differential mutation uh, frequencies um, that are highly enriched only in specific subtypes as shown here. Um, and then, of course, on top of that, um, a paradigm-based analysis that compares two of these subtypes, C2 and C8, uh, they're shown here with a fairly significant differential outcome. C8 in the blue, a better outcome. C2, a worse outcome. And C2 actually has a significant elevation of different immune-related pathways relative to C8. And so um, this is an interesting um, potential predictor of how these patients will do in the disease. Um, and harkens to my last point uh, about clinical trials design and the integration of genomic data with immunogenomic data, um, which is what I'm going to talk about next. So what about the use of immunogenomics to predict different aspects of the immune activation in the body as a system, um, not just at the tumor? And, and so um, let's sort of go through these different nuances of immunogenomics, if you will. So um, one important thing that I mentioned already, but just to reemphasize about, um, you know, the link between genomics and immunity is this, um, uh, you know, finding that was originally reported in 2015 and just resulted from a larger scale study um, in FDA approval of an anti-PD-1 drug, pembrolizumab, in any tissue site regardless for patients that have mismatch repair defective um, genomes. And of course, this can be determined um, using a genomic algorithm. Some people would argue that it could also be determined using immunohistochemistry, and that's fair. Um, but I think uh, just one more thing you can do with your genomic data. Um, we've also worked hard on this problem, which is um, using the uh, data from exomes as well as RNA sequencing to go through a path, uh, sort of pipeline-based analysis um, in our PVAC-seq algorithm to identify um, not neoantigen load, so that can be important um, based on prediction of the binding of mutant peptides to the HLA molecules in the patient's genome to predict neoantigens and then um, substantiate the ones that are expressed using RNA data. And of course, in our studies, we've, we've also taken this the next step beyond neoantigen prediction um, to actually uh, designing personalized vaccines for patients, getting uh, uh, them in, in the context of a clinical trial. And this is um, something that we reported, again, quite some time ago. Um, there have recently been two additional clinical trials using variants of this paradigm um, that just came out in Nature and also um, reflecting uh, many of the results that we saw, but also now adding in the checkpoint blockade inhibitor on top of the personalized vaccine and showing very nice durable responses. And so there seems to be still a, a nice interplay here um, in terms of the immunogenomic aspect of, um, of these clinical trials. 
The other thing we were able to do in this melanoma trial, beyond showing some efficacy using the neoantigen vaccine to elicit T cells um, in these individual patients, is that, um, it, and this was in early beta testing at the time, using the adaptive um, um, approach to, uh, uh, to evaluating the T cell uh, receptor uh, diversity. And here we looked at both the tumor and the peripheral circulation, and what we were able to show for different patients and different um, uh, neoantigens is that in the black bars, sort of pre-existing um, TCR beta clonotypes, but in the clear bars, dramatically expanded um, uh, TCR repertoire um, post-vaccine uh, in these patients. And I think this is a form of liquid biopsy, or can be, um, which I'll talk about at the end. Um, and I think is a potentially very exciting way not only to evaluate patients um, in the um, pre-trial or pre-treatment setting, um, but also as a monitoring approach um, as they go through uh, therapeutic modalities. And so um, just to go back to this paradigm, I wanted to add in one more thing that we can do with RNA, and that's sort of in what I call immunotyping. Um, and it goes to the um, TCR beta repertoire and a couple of other aspects of which I'll just finish up with. So then back to bladder cancer, just to finish off, um, we recently, uh, with the mainly driven by group at Memorial Sloan Kettering, I was lucky to be involved, um, uh, pr produced this paper in um, PLOS Medicine, which is a correlative analysis of data from a bladder cancer study now um, in the setting of anti-PD-L1 atezolizumab. Um, and so this clinical trial um, uh, essentially uh, studied patients at Memorial Sloan Kettering with these following goals, um, really to sort of evaluate this potential connection between mutation and or neoantigen load um, and therapeutic benefit, as well as looking at um, the intratumoral and peripheral blood TCR clonality and its um, predictive ability on clinical outcomes. And so we generated the data sets that I've told you about already. Um, including whole exome sequencing and TCR sequencing, um, and then compared these with, um, uh, in the context of durable clinical benefit, defined as progression-free survival or overall survival. And I'll also point out that we did conventional immunohistochemistry here, looking at PDL1 positivity in the microenvironment, again, as a comparator. So just briefly, um, I want to focus on a couple of results from this study. Um, in particular, what measures associated with durable clinical benefit? So for the ones that we evaluated using genomics, we found that TCR clonality was an important predictor. And in particular, people with TCR clonality below the median in the peripheral blood um, had a better um, outcome um, based on progression-free survival as well as overall survival, shown here. Um, and we also noted that peripheral blood expansion of TCRs three weeks after the treatment was initiated um, was a predictor of durable clinical benefit. And this really underscores the continuity of the tumor and the blood compartments, um, at least in the setting of the bladder cancer. Um, you also won't be surprised that a common predictor of durable clinical benefit, which is just the till proliferation in the tumor, and here in the microenvironment actually, um, was uh, predictive of a better outcome. But I think uh, what I want to finish with is just sort of what's the association between the clinical immune uh, variables and shown in a couple of figures from the paper. So first of all, um, these rating scores, 0, 1, 2, reflect the immunohistochemistry of PDL1 in the microenvironment. And this till proportion was um, estimated from TCR sequencing. So that's um, what's shown on the y-axis of this um, plot. And this is um, a, a clear association between till proportion and the TCR um, sequencing uh, metric that we generated. Um, but if we look at the hazard ratio then for progression or, uh, or mortality, there's a very strong association with the PDL1 in the microenvironment that's present here um, and, um, and this uh, measure. But then lastly, and this is kind of the bummer uh, to finish off with, I wanted to finish on a low note. Um, no, seriously, um, I, what, I wanted to, what I wanted to point out is that um, what we did find is that one of the confounders here of this study is that regardless of having any of the right bar biomarkers, if you will, by some of these measures here and other ones that I didn't have time to talk about, if you had liver metastases, it didn't matter. 
you always did, um, your hazard ratio was essentially equivalent regardless of your um, PDL1 uh, staining or really anything else. And so I think this is sort of the provocative message that I kind of wanted to end with, which is I think um, in the context of these clinical trials, especially in immunotherapy um, aspects, what we need to be doing a, a little bit better job of is really better defining the patients that are likely to um, uh, have a chance of responding to these very powerful drugs. Um, and to me, you know, having these um, advanced markers of disease, which I understand, you know, metastasis as a means for getting onto a clinical trial, don't get me wrong, um, but really evaluating the patient's um, likelihood to uh, respond, I think, is um, going to need to become a lot more nuanced. Um, and maybe by using these combinatorial approaches that I've talked about today, um, we'll be able to get at a better approach to that um, in the future. Um, I just wanted to say one last thing about genomics, and that's the context of liquid biopsy, which I also feel very strongly is important to start including in the context of our clinical trial design. Yes, it's more work to do, but I think they're actually fairly straightforward assays. Once you've identified from your initial data set um, of exome sequencing and RNA-seq, firstly, the different mutations that you should be following in the course of this patient's um, uh, you know, time on the clinical trial itself, um, but also I'd like to argue that knowing this information about the TCR clonality and other immune markers that I, I talked about just in this last study from bladder cancer, these could also be similarly profiled using the peripheral circulation uh, material, and so you would sort of have a twofer, the interplay, if you will, uh, between the the tumor uh, cell-free DNA, where it goes up, down, um, et cetera, in the course of the clinical trial, and that patient's response according to imaging, as well as their immune marker-directed um, biomarkers uh, while they're also on the trial. And I think this could be valuable, especially as we move in this era now towards combining targeted therapies with immunotherapies. I think we're um, going to need to um, chart these through very, very carefully um, so that we better understand when we're um, putting that big data set together at the end of it all. Um, where we've, um, what we've learned from the um, patients on our clinical trial. So I'll just conclude with a couple of simple conclusions here. Um, I think I've tried to convince you that genomics is playing an increasing role in cancer diagnosis and treatment. And by extension, I think it can be incorporated into either design of clinical trials or evaluating retrospectively in correlative setting or designing the um, prospective trial to come. And then um, immunogenomics, I think, has the capacity to really personalize cancer therapy um, in the ways that I've talked about, but I think it's also going to really contribute in a valuable way to um, therapeutic response and response monitoring um, as we move forward in more and more sophisticated approaches to our clinical trials. So I'll just finish by acknowledging lots of people, um, and thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Elaine. Um, questions for Elaine. I, I'll ask one while we find the brave souls who will ask you questions. Um, so single cell analysis <laughs> is um, all the rage. The scientists use it. I use it in my lab. People are starting to use it on clinical specimens, too, to ask some of the same uh, uh, questions that you were raising, particularly in the immune therapy space. Sure. You didn't present it, and you presented most things. Um, what do you think about using single cell in the, in the setting of individual patients on trials? Um, I think from a clinical standpoint and from a clinical trial standpoint, it's really going to elevate the cost pretty significantly. Um, I, I guess I'm, I'm a little bit wanting to wait and see, you know, mm. what. So we, we've done this a lot at the DNA level, and I've still never been completely convinced that you can learn more from just deep sequencing of both tumor isolates than you can from single cell. Um, I do think the T-SNE plot type analysis from single cell in RNA is actually becoming quite interesting. But again, I think the burden of evidence is that, you know, can we actually prove that we're getting more out of it than we can out of these um, bulk RNA measures? And I may just be ignorant of the literature because I haven't paid that much attention to it, but I think that's really where the burden of proof is gonna, gonna lie. Okay, thanks. We have yeah. a question up. Kanti. 
very interesting, but from a clinician point of view, uh, I was wondering how practical is the next paradigm, big data incorporation, and then you were talking about phase two or phase two B trials. Uh, whether they can be available in real time to enable large sample size accrual in a speedy manner? Yeah, so I think that's a fair question. I think the timeline for, for doing these analyses has been shrinking significantly, shall we say. So just for a few vignettes, I mean, um, when we started doing exome capture, you know, years ago, it was a three-day hybridization, and now you can do that in two hours. Um, similarly, for the run times on DNA sequencers. So I tend to not worry, you know, so much with advanced robotics and the shrinking uh, timelines here about generating the data. I think the challenge is really to have your um, pipelines for the data analysis in place so that every patient that comes through for that clinical trial can get thrown up against the wall, if you will, of the big data modeling that you've already done. And so then it's just really the price of electrons or compute cycles, um, which, you know, I, I don't worry about as long as you've got that pipeline already established. So that's really what we've been working hard on um, since I moved, is, is to really make sure that you're ready um, across all of the fronts. Um, and I think the other part that plays into this paradigm is just the fact that we're still um, a little bit in competition for that, you know, clinical biopsy material that we need to get to do our analyses. And so one of the other things we've been working on is not just the timeline, but how little amount of material can we actually get away with and still generate the data sets that we need while the conventional pathology um, goes on with what they need. And at the end of the day, I don't see NGS in exclusion to everything else. I think it just becomes a part of precision medicine that helps us inform us, you know, even better about that individual patient, but using the data universe that's out there to compare them against. So that, that's kind of philosophically where we're at. But very, very good questions in all things that we worry about. Yeah. Okay, well, Sandy. Sandy has a question. Elaine, I'm wondering if, oh, Elaine, I'm wondering if the data is yet sufficient to be able to tell us what the predictive value of finding a pathway activated is for the response to, a, to targeted therapy against that pathway is when the pathway activation is due to a genetic, an identified genetic cause, you know, a mutation, an amplification, versus when there is no underlying genetic cause you can point to. Sandy, you're very soft-spoken. Oh, okay, let me, let, me, let, me, let me speak louder. So the question is, do we have enough data to be able to say what the predictive value for targeted therapies are when you have an activated pathway in a tumor and that activation is because of a genetic lesion, a mutation, an amplification, versus when that pathway activation is not anchored in an underlying genomic abnormality? I don't think we're there yet. I think that's a very, uh, that's, it's a wise question, and I, I would argue that we're getting closer because of the interplay of RNA, but very few people are sort of using this clinically just yet. So it's been used a lot in sort of the paradigmatic approach, but now we really uh, are f focused on implementing it clinically, and I think we'll get to those answers as just, again, the data set grows and the feedback loop is there in terms of what did that patient get and how did they do. So yeah, it's a great point, but uh, we're, we're still not there yet. And, and I think, you know, I, I always emphasize that while we're very advanced in terms of discovery, there's always more discovery to be done, especially for these metastatic patients like the Nature paper that I talked about. I think this is a big step forward because, we, you know, metastasis is largely what kills patients. Hi, Elaine. I'm okay. going to build on have a similar thought to Sandy, but ultimately I don't think I'm personally smart enough to read the tea leaves of the genome and figure out exactly who's going to re respond and not. So I see a lot of diversity in ways to activate the same pathways, mm -hmm. some of them yeah. happening multiple times in the same tumor mm -hmm. of different strengths, different alleles have different strengths, so you, yep. you have to take that into account. 
So I think a gloss on the, the trials that we're doing with precision medicine is they are an enrichment. You're trying to get a better response rate and more durable responses, yeah. but then you have to just go in and be a cell biologist, look at the proteins, look at the interactions, look at the pathways. You focused a lot on pathway, um, and ultimately you have to read that out in different ways, I believe, than, than just the DNA mutations or even the RNA, which I've been working on a long time. That's itself indirect. Um, right, but I think, I, I guess maybe it wasn't clear. What, what I'm trying to suggest is that if you can set up that analysis, right, using a very, very large data set like we've generated from TCGA and it's sort of there, um, every patient that comes in, regardless of their combination, because they're always different of DNA and RNA alterations, RNA being a readout also of, of you know, things that are going on at the DNA level that you can't necessarily measure, your likelihood of finding the right place to drug or right places to drug and the efficacy of that effort is going to be enhanced because you have that data mm -hmm. universe to compare so it against. So we, that's we agree that yeah. we should assemble this data set in the first yep. trial. All I'm advocating for is a deep use of other technologies to look at the biopsy specimens to, because it will be, you'll enrich, but it'll not be 100%. Why wasn't it 100%? Why did these people not respond? They had the molecular lesion. Mm -hmm. You know, it could be that they have another anti-apoptotic uh, protein highly expressed that you can, couldn't suss out. So it's, I think we have to embrace that those other avenues in addition, I mean, you know, I love genomics, but, but there's more to the cancer side. Okay, fair enough. And we will be leading that discussion tomorrow at 11 o'clock.